So I've been teaching and commenting for several decades now on the human foreskin, a much misunderstood bit of human anatomy. And there's so much to know about it and so interesting. I planned a book and I wrote one chapter. <laughs> it was the chapter on the foreskin and also touching on the issue of circumcision, which of course is the main uh, is the main way we don't know about the human foreskin. So having made a short video on YouTube, I got a lot of requests when I mentioned that I had written this chapter and I didn't really know how to share it. Where's the rest of the book? I didn't write it. I got busy with the, with the anatomy from A to Z project and my whole subscriber site. And hopefully someday I will complete this book. But for now, I thought, ah, this is helpful information. People want to hear it. They've asked me to share it. Folks don't like to read that much anymore. So maybe I'll read it to you. I read to my children through their entire lives when they were little and, uh, and growing up in homeschool. And so I enjoy reading books out loud. So I thought, let me do that. So I'm sitting here in front of the fire. You can't see the dog. She's off screen. It's a snowy day outside, and I thought this would be the perfect time to read from you a chapter, not chapter one, but a chapter from a book called Pars Intima, a rebranding campaign for the human body by moi, and that's me, Gil Headley. Uh, the chapter doesn't even have a title, but you'll get to know what it's about after a little while. I call it, yeah, I don't know what to call a chapter. So for now, I'm just going to read it. It's about 40 pages long. I have no, long, no idea how long this is going to take. So hopefully you will enjoy this and find it helpful and perhaps share it with folks who, who are concerned about maybe uh, they're having a boy, they don't know what to do, or, or maybe you just would like to... Actually, I have test, test read this chapter with several men who, who uh, are intact, as I like to say. And they were delighted to learn <laughs> what, what they have and, and what they didn't lose <clears throat> uh, with respect to circumcision. So here we go. It's a little personal. Again, it's written as a book. I didn't really plan to read it, but here, here goes anyway. Most guys' first love affair is with what's hanging between their legs. Let's be honest. A strange metamorphosis happens before our eyes when we hit puberty. We endure the humiliation that accompanies the public transformation of adolescent faces, where one's nose seems to outpace the growth of everything else. To our utter dismay, our voices switch octaves every third syllable, yet the magic happening below in private sees us through it all. A wee organ that had seemed to be nothing but an odd little joke to us for all these years suddenly takes on a previously unimagined significance. In puberty, you find yourself lying all the time about why you have locked yourself in the bathroom for so long every day. It is way easier to forgive a seemingly oversized nose facing you oddly in the mirror when the tailbone at your thighs is suddenly standing at attention and outpacing nasal growth by several inches. Whoever told the story of Pinocchio got it all wrong. It's not the lies that cause the growth, but the growth that prompts the lies. <laughs> That's pretty funny. <laughs> Yet more significant than the obvious size shift, along with the growth of pubic hair, are the changes in sensation. Aye, there's the rub. On Saturday morning, unhurried by a blaring alarm interrupting your sleep cycle, you wake relaxed and well-rested with a raging boner that simply will not retreat. Now, this is not the first time you've experienced an erection. These have been happening even from the womb and not insignificantly showing up at the most inopportune times and without the least provocation. Like while reading a book report in front of your sixth grade class. But there is a certain earnestness that now accompanies the phenomenon that simply cannot be ignored. So you put your hand down there in an honest attempt to figure out what's up and how to make it go down. Otherwise, you're never going to make it out from under the covers and join the day. It feels kind of nice. 
Nothing to complain about there. Your hands get to know and become familiar with the changing shapes and textures. After a few minutes, you get utterly bored with that, put on jeans to hide that thing, and run off for a bowl of cereal. Then one magical weekend it happens. The curiosity-inspiring sensations accompanying this particularly vital organ manifesting between your thighs grow more intense rather than remaining at a pleasant plateau. How convenient to have such a phenomenon located within such easy reach of your hands. <clears throat> if the design of these magnificent bodies were any indication of how we might well use them, the location of our intimate zones within so easy reach of our hands surely is meant to be a great blessing, not a cruel temptation. If a loving divine power had not meant for us to touch ourselves, we would have been given arms like a T-Rex, placing these delights decidedly out of reach. What sensations before this day had been pleasant, but relatively unchanging, now increasingly heighten with your touch? You instinctively accelerate the frequency of your self-stimulation in response to the magnifying sensations it produces. This feedback loop of pleasurable, pleasurable sensation and manual manipulation intensify, accompanied by changes in your breathing and perhaps some odd little vocalizations, and suddenly, much to your utter surprise, the whole event reaches a climax, complete with fluid spurting out of yourself, different than anything you have ever experienced. And the accompanying sensations feel incredibly good. Who could make this stuff up? What a wonderful gift! Unless, of course, you are then immediately filled with shame and loathing. Uh, this would be, despite the initial, however fleeting, sense of having graduated to some obviously higher level of the human experience. Such guilt and shame is not a biological phenomenon embedded necessarily with acts of self-pleasure. Those feelings are cultural accretions rooted in religious and social beliefs not universally shared. My Jewish friends from boyhood clearly did not share my Roman Catholic guilt on this particular topic. That having been said, given the great predominance of sex-negative beliefs at the roots of American culture, shame for the body in general, and sex in particular, are rampant. Again, this is not a biological necessity. It is cultural baggage. To this point, on a visit to the Dallas Zoo with my, my partner in all things, we stood before the lovely outdoor mandrill exhibit. Mandrills are fairly large monkey critters with distinctive red and bluish-white facial markings, giving them a really my way or the highway kind of face. Together with the rest of the crowd, we beheld a bored-looking mandrill seated a few yards before us. At first, he was looking about absent-mindedly. Then, with no apparent provocation, he gave himself a few pulls down below and promptly ejaculated before our group of bemused zoo-goers. He blithely tidied himself up, licking his fingers like he'd just been given the bowl from a freshly mixed cake. There was clearly no shame or guilt for this public display of self-stimulation on the part of the mandrel. There was, however, some not quite so comfortable chortles from the human gallery with quick sideward eye flicks gauging the group member's response. When sharing social space, we are generally keen to fit in appropriately. For us, that kind of behavior would land you in jail. So keen are we to constrain ourselves to privacy in such matters. We all seemed willing and without reservation to forgive this mandrel monkey fellow, however, for his lack of discretion by our standards. The real marvel was his lack of self-consciousness as compared to our own. Bonded by this shared witness of Mother Nature's wonders, we onlookers dispersed to consider the event on our own. Our self-consciousness is not without its shadows. Self-consciousness is at the very root of what makes us, by our own standards, to be an intelligent species. It also opens the door to all sorts of neuroses and psychological pathologies. Our sexual mores and even anatomy are subject to the vicissitudes of time, place, and the social and religious beliefs that accompany them. Beliefs about what is appropriate with regard to sexual functions and expression are not static, a priori certainties upon which humans universally agree for all time. Further, these changing beliefs can be directly at odds with our basic health as biological systems. Tensions, both physical and emotional, can build in us when the basic functions and expressions of bodily life and our beliefs about them are in conflict. Some moral systems, in fact, consider it a duty to suppress bodily functions and repress our feelings about them in order to form a person spiritually. 
And a case in point would be the practice of male circumcision. This practice has a long history on several continents over several millennia at least. The procedure has been employed to ritually mark a transition from boyhood to manhood, from outside to within a covenant, from moral risk to moral safety, as a purported prophylactic to disease, and more. In the United States, the practice is rooted particularly in the uncomfortable relationship of our culture to the reality of sexual pleasure. It arose as a proposed medical cure for a perceived moral problem. However, before exploring in more detail the ways in which the male organ has been problematized in our culture, we should first consider the gift exactly as it's given at birth, intact. Intact meaning whole. While perfectly formed for the purposes of infant life, the human penis at birth is an immature and still developing organ. The skin of the shaft of the penis extends beyond the glands or head, overlapping itself, creating a tapering, double-layered covering of skin. This foreskin not only covers the glands, it is also adherent to it in the newborn baby. The foreskin is integral to the entire structure and function of the penis. The foreskin of a newborn is not yet capable of retracting due to this adherence, and its fixed position forms a protective covering for the highly sensitive glands and the urethral opening through which urine passes. Due to the extensive practice of routine circumcision, many Americans, including medical practitioners, have never even seen an intact penis. It's hard to give thoughtful consideration to something for which you have no point of reference. The foreskin in American culture is mostly known to exist by its absence. Its presence is acknowledged in our language predominantly through its negation. A penis with a foreskin is called uncircumcised, as if a person in this condition were somehow missing something, namely circumcision. This linguistic practice puts the tail on its head, as it were. What is intact is spoken of by convention as somehow lacking, and what is reduced with a surgical modification by some kind of verbal magic is considered complete. My relationship to the foreskin started like most typical Americans of my era. I simply had no clue as to what the word referred. I had no point of reference on my own body, nor on any of my peers from gym class. My ironic introduction to the foreskin only occurred in full adulthood. I found myself one day enjoying the Turkish baths in Lower Manhattan. We were a group of guys out for a bachelor's party and found our way to the steam room. There we sat, sweating away in the vapor filled room, everyone buck naked, sitting on our towels. There was no surprises on our side of the fog, but glancing across the room, I couldn't help but notice a group of four or five Orthodox Jewish men seated opposite us. What surprised me was that my cursory glance, followed by a probably overlong and situationally inappropriate study, revealed those men to have far more skin than anyone in our group of secular and Christian folk. They had significant partial coverage of the glands where we had nothing of the sort. Only the very tip of their glands was exposed. I was lastingly perplexed. I knew that folks following the Jewish tradition circumcised as part of their religion. So if what I was seeing for the first time is what traditional circumcision looked like, then what the heck happened to me and to my friends and why? We who supposedly did not follow Mosaic law were somehow even more circumcised than those who did so to the letter. Ironic indeed. Anatomy. This experience launched me on a quest to understand this missing link in our anatomy, in my anatomy. If we fellows are born with a foreskin, what's it for and where did it go? As it turns out, this is some very interesting skin. For starters, the foreskin is an integral aspect of the erogenous territory of the penis, and it is highly sensitive to touch. Some folks quibble about the exact degree of sensitivity that is inherently particular to the foreskin, throwing out nerve counts as if this could settle the score and render the foreskin more or less relevant. Suffice it to say, it is the most erogenous aspect of the penis in terms of free nerve endings and more erogenous than the glands or head of the organ which it covers. Still, I would counsel against any reductionist 
perspective that would prioritize one stretch of tissue over another based on relative numbers of nerves in this way. It is the whole package and its interrelated functions that are the subject of our interest here. Whether your one fingertip is a bit more or less sensitive than another, you still want them all, right? The foreskin also protects the sensitivity of the glands or head of the penis. As mentioned above, the foreskin is adherent to the infant glands. It's stuck to it and it's supposed to be. It can take all the way until early adolescence for the foreskin to de-adhere completely so that it can move freely over the glands. This process happens slowly over time and completes anywhere generally between the ages of three and 13 or so. The adhesions breaking down progressively. This occurs as a result of movement, self-handling, and the increasing size of the penis. The sum of these and the concomitant erections eventually entirely free the foreskin to glide over rather than attach to the glands. There is no immediate necessity for the foreskin to be freed from its normal attachment to the glands in the youthful penis. Ignorance of this fact may result in premature detachment of these tissues by forcing the foreskin to roll back completely from the glands before the time is right for that individual, which is extremely varied. This timing, like all matters, human and anatomical, is variable. Premature tearing apart of the tissues is both very painful and completely unnecessary. It is in a highly germ-phobic and hyper-clean culture, parents and their pediatricians typically bear an abundance of concern about hygiene. They fear that lack of access to the inside of the intact penis of their child is somehow unhygienic. In fact, a pre-adolescent child's glands does not need to be cleaned with soap or otherwise any more than you would wash a baby's mouth out with soap or otherwise. The infant's penis is a marvelously self-cleaning system. The delicate epithelium of the glands covered by the foreskin is regularly flushed with urine. Urine itself is a fabulous humectant, that is, moisturizer, due to the presence of urea. Urea binds water molecules and consequently serves to moisturize the glands, while the urine simultaneously flushes out the tissues protected by the foreskin. Nature has provided us with a marvelously self-cleaning system. The space between the inner surface of the foreskin and the glands, when no longer adherent, is generally moist. This wetness is not from urine so much as from other minuscule amounts of fluids produced by the seminal vesicles, prostate, and the urethral opening itself. This moisture contributes to the lubricant called smegma, uh, from a Greek word meaning soap, or the Latin meaning an ointment, the production of smegma is typical to the grown penis, not that of an infant, and it generally, though not necessarily, declines in old age. Skin cells breaking down at these contacting surfaces provide another component to this material. This breakdown of cells is facilitated by lysozyme. Lysozyme is an enzyme whose presence in the smegma confers upon it a mild antiseptic property because the cell walls of bacteria can also be broken down by this same enzyme. Cool. Once the foreskin retracts naturally with the development of the maturing organ, freshly produced smegma acts as a lubricant of the foreskin over the glands. Once this stage of development is reached, warm water should be used to clear away any potential adverse over-accumulation over of such matter. This could occur within the space between the foreskin and the glands, in the inner folds of the foreskin, and around the edge of the corona of the glands. Self-care care here is, simple, is a simple matter when regularly addressed. Self-cleaning in this way is a normal and important part of human hygiene. We regularly clear the Sandman out from the corner of our eyes in the morning as a normal routine since its production is expected and recurring. And the same goes for the pars intima. Nothing complicated about that. The foreskin also has a layer of smooth muscle cells that enables it to hug close to the glands as it tapers into a, a whirl before doubling back on itself, formerly called the peripenic muscle, peri from the Greek for around and penis from the Latin for tail. So literally it's the around the tail muscle. It is now referred to as the dartos muscle fascia or muscle or fascia or the superficial fascia of the shaft of the force and the foreskin the sphincter-like function of this layer 
of the foreskin creates the possibility for there to be an inside and an outside to the organ in its flaccid state. When a shaft of the penis hardens during an erection, the glans emerges from its protected inner space and its own particular shape and texture become visible. Turtles work pretty much the same way. Some men are naturally endowed with less or more foreskin than others. Some men have foreskin enough that even during an erection, their glands remain covered, not from adhesion, but simply from the abundance of skin with its wrapping property conferred by its intact muscle cell layer. In this case, the foreskin can be manually retracted or it may simply push back on contact during intercourse. Variety really is the norm when it comes to human anatomy. Sex function. So now we know that the foreskin belongs there primarily because it is there, we being born with it. As the organ matures, it grows in every aspect along with other secondary sex characteristics. With sexual maturity, the sex functional aspects become apparent beyond the mechanical and immunological protections afforded to the glands so far discussed. The shaft of the human penis stiffens during an erection even without having a penis bone, as is common among many other mammalian species. A bear has a penis bone. We instead have a dense, regular fibrous fascia which surrounds the erectile tissues. When those tissues engorge with blood, the penis stiffens and is capable of penetration. The bulbal urethral glands live on either side of the urethra at the base of the prostate gland. During excitation, these glands produce a clear, viscous fluid. This fluid, or pre-ejaculate, changes the pH of the urethra to favor the passage of the alkaline-loving sperm. The fluid also functions as a very slippery lubricant for the repetitive movement of the foreskin over the glands during sex, whether alone or partnered. This movement of the smooth, soft foreskin over the glands, already sensitive by nature, is highly pleasurable. Sensitivity is greatly heightened during erogenous activity and sexual excitation. The addition of bulbourethral fluids to mediate the movement of the foreskin over the glands facilitates the mechanics of heightening sexual pleasure and tension. Those fluids also contribute to the electrical and energetic potentials being generated by the differential movement of the skin over the whole shaft and glands of the penis, much like the lubricant on the paddles that perfect the contact of defibrillator pads. The fluid is an excellent conductor and the activity generates palpable charge. The movements toward orgasm result in a charge and discharge cycle accompanied by a series of pleasurable jolts in the form of involuntary muscular contractions. No complaints against bobo urethral fluids here. When engaged in penetrative sex then, the shaft of the intact penis demonstrates that normal sex function of the foreskin is to provide an excitatory sleeve in and out of which the underlying penile shaft repetitively glides. To be blunt, the penis is designed to itself. The engorged erectile tissues of the vulva narrow the opening of the vagina, essentially hugging the shaft skin in place while the penile shaft thrusts. There is the outer hug and the inner hug. The vaginal walls thus convey the pleasurable sensations of pressure and filling while being spared direct abrasion of the epithelial surfaces by the penis during intercourse. The foreskin pleasurably frictions the penile glands mediated by the bulbal urethral fluid, and simultaneously, the foreskin itself reduces the friction of the penile shaft relative to the vaginal walls. As anatomical features go, the function of the foreskin is a clear win-win for everyone involved. <laughs> right? The penis moves in and out of itself. The vagina is protected by the foreskin from abrasion of the penis. All this discussion so far has possibly provoked a nagging question in the mind of you, my dear listener. Pointedly, if the foreskin is so basic and essential an aspect of human anatomy and sexual function, why would anyone, no less everyone, accept a general policy of cutting it off? How has the normal, given, intact human penis come under so regular, so violent, and so rarely questioned an assault? Commonplace corporal punishment of children has long passed out of vogue. Neither teachers nor parents are considered mainly in their rights when caught striking children. We call that child abuse these days. Yet somehow we don't even blink 
or worse yet, we giggle, joke about and trivialize the fact that over half the newborn boys in the United States are still subject to having their most sensitive pars intima literally sliced off without anesthesia just days out of the womb. Our culture has long problematized the genitals in such a way as to permit such a travesty. The time has come to reframe the narrative and to consider the matter in a more positive light. Circumcision history. In the ancient story from the book of Genesis of the Hebrew Torah, Abraham had his faith tested. He was asked to sacrifice his only son, Isaac, a very contrary notion, given that Isaac himself was quite the miracle baby, born of Sarah, who was thought to be past her childbearing years. In obedience, Abraham made all the preparations, but in the last moment, his hand was stayed from the deadly deed, lucky for Isaac. Instead, Abraham was told to sacrifice a nearby ram. Again, the man of faith obeyed. Not long after, in the narrative, Abraham's God makes a covenant with him, the mark of which is the circumcision of the menfolk of his people. Then, and for all posterity, the mark of circumcision would identify their belonging to their God and recall to them the promises made to them as chosen ones. On this account, then, there's one thing I'll say for circumcision. It is a major improvement over child sacrifice. Abraham's new family religious tradition of circumcision marked a shift in the traditions of the land of the Canaanites, where child sacrifice was practiced at that time, as it was in so many other parts of the world. As Abraham's family tree branched, so too did the practice of circumcision. Infant boys in the Jewish tradition were circumcised on the eighth day after they were born, and wisely so, as the clotting factors that would prevent the child from bleeding to death after the surgery are not developed until eight days after birth. One can only wonder on the trial and error process that preceded that certainty. There might have been a few accidental child sacrifices along the way before arriving at the least risky timing. The extended family of Abraham were not the only ones, however, to invade the land of the Canaanites. Sometime later, the Romans showed up, along with the sporting practices promoted by the Greeks. Their games involved wrestling and were played naked. In the past, and still today, human cultures demonstrate markedly different sensibilities regarding the human body, clothing, sexuality, and physical contact. That having been said, having one's penile glands exposed, as in the case of the circumci circumcised men of the Jewish people, was considered by the Greeks and Romans as unseemly, at least as far as sports play was concerned. This prompted the Jewish athletes of the time to restore their foreskins via stretching in order to be properly dressed for the games. The mark of circumcision was not so severe that it could not be creatively undone by various techniques. And for as long as there has been circumcision, there have been men attempting to restore themselves to their original intact status. In order to combat this undoing of the mark of the covenant, the rabbis introduced procedures that more dramatically reduced the foreskin, making it more difficult to restore. Such practices faded eventually, as the impetus for them receded into history. How then did the current practice evolve in our modern times? The roots of modern circumcision, as practiced in the United States, go directly back not to the Jewish tradition, but to the preachings of the Protestant moralizers from those periods of religious fervor in America known as the Great Awakening. At various times and for extended periods during the 18th and 19th centuries, evangelical preachers held revivals throughout the United States tent meetings and churches filled with the curious who came to listen and be swayed by the words of these charismatic speakers who sought to stoke the fires of Christian fervor and moral rectitude by their standards. Many people left old Europe and came to the New World shores of America to practice their religion freely, but many others came to escape religiosity altogether. While the American experiment was avowedly and constitutionally a sectarian one, there have throughout its history been those who would assert their religious beliefs and attempt to establish them as broadly as possible one way or another. The small towns of America, with their relatively temperate religiosity, therefore appeared to these evangelists, primarily hailing from England, to be a rich field to cultivate and harvest. During the Victorian period, the suspicion of the sensual nature of humanity was particularly deep. The sinful nature of humanity was tied to its sexual appetite. Circumcision was preached as a medical cure for the perceived moral ills of lust 
and masturbation. The modern period of circumcision was thus based in a conscious, concerted effort to thwart pleasurable sensation, its pursuit and temptations where it is most intense, and to reduce the pars intima exclusively to their generative function as much as possible, thus the genitals. On the terms of the evangelical moralists of the time, sex was for making babies, not for pleasure. Pleasure was equated with temptation leading to sin. Since circumcision disrupted and reduced pleasurable sensations for both partners while leaving the procreative function intact, the promotion of its general practice was a perfect fit for the prurient sensibilities of the Victorian evangelists and Americans bought into the program. Now, I've asked quite a few fellows over the years, did circumcision cure you of your proclivity to lust and to masturbate? I haven't run this past the folks at Gallup, but my small sampling concludes to a resounding no. No one has been cured, but millions of baby boys continue to be circumcised, they and their parents unwitting dupes of a failed prophylactic approach, the exceedingly questionable habit of which we have yet to kick. And it turns out that although the tent preachers have come and gone, the habit of circumcising induced in the American population is now perpetuated not by the religious zealots, but by the medical establishment. Dubious rationalizations continue to be put forward based on doubtful studies purporting to justify the practice. Before we take a closer look at some of those reasons, we can first consider the actual surgery, what it entails, and its impact on health and sex function. Surgery without anesthesia. The current practice of circumcision is also known as the stripping of the glands. It is a procedure quite distinct in both technique and purpose from the ritual circumcision as still practiced today by the Jewish community. While trying to wrap my head around the consciousness with which circumcision is performed, I asked a doctor friend of mine of his experience. He told me that while in medical school, he participated in rounds on the ob wards of the hospital. At some point, the resident quizzed him whether he had done a circumcision yet. Replying that he had not, he was told to get a baby. So he set to the task of finding a likely candidate among the newborns down the hall, got the parents to sign the consent forms, and thus returned with the unwitting charge. Rest assured, no one knew, really knew, what they were doing. Be still my heart. The following paragraphs perhaps should be skipped over by the squeamish. I know I always fast forward past the torture scenes in movies when I know they are coming. Step one, the baby is taken from its mother to another room where it is restrained by being strapped down limb to board to prevent its flight or fight. While infant circumcision has up until recently been practiced without anesthesia, in more recent years, a local lidocaine injection or ointment may be applied. That's at the, at the circumciser's discretion. And we now know that the circumcision may not necessarily be an actual doctor. It might be a student or a nurse. Or... Anyway, while infant circumcision has up until recently been practiced without... Okay, this means that even today it may not be applied based on the discretion and sensibilities or lack thereof on the part of the physician. Now, I have read deeply into the hagiographies of the saints across traditions, the stories of the holy ones. Generally, we reserve unanesthetized surgery for the willing ranks of fakirs and mystics whose training enables them to demonstrate special powers to withstand or not feel violations of their bodies experienced as intensely faith, uh, painful by ordinary folks. Suspecting that the great majority of infants are not counted among the ranks of such adepts, we are left to wonder under what condition it could possibly be considered a standard of legitimate practice that anesthesia would be waived for an infant having surgery upon its most sensitive organ. The mother can't hear the cries. The surgeon is inured to them. The babe is pinned down and rendered defenseless even to squirm. And so it goes. Step two. The surgeon then introduces a blunt instrument, such as a closed hemostat, into the whirled aperture formed by the foreskin as it tapers past the glands. The purpose of this is to strip the foreskin away from the glands to which it is anatomically connected at this stage of the infant's development 
As described in the anatomy section above, it is supposed to be attached, as this relationship constitutes the initial protection of the sensitive glands and the urethral opening. Prematurely tearing the two apart is painful and injurious to this immunological function of the penis. There's also the risk of accidentally placing an instrument into the urethral opening within the foreskin opening and the subsequent actions seriously damaging the penis. The intended mechanical deadherence is not a step requisite to the ceremonial circumcision as practiced by the Jewish faithful. The mark of the covenant is sufficiently accomplished by the incision of some part of the foreskin where it extends beyond the glands. The complete stripping of the glands is the practice not of the Jewish people, but of the Victorian evangelicals and the heirs to their practice, medical and otherwise. And it is the medical establishment and the culture at large that has accepted and perpetuated the practice over generations. Step three. Again, in contrast to the Jewish practice, the surgical procedure next entails the actual protraction or pulling forward of the foreskin in a way that maximizes the amount of skin removed. This is not about making a mark to indicate membership and identity with a community of faith. This is about changing the structure of the pars intima in a way that transforms in an intentionally reductive matter the pleasure potential and the sex function of the organ. That's why this procedure was designed. It was designed to reduce pleasure, to disrupt pleasure for both partners, to change the organ in a way that reduced it to a, gen a generative function as opposed to uh, intimate pleasure function. The whole point of it all was to create an obstacle to physically pleasurable sensation. I can't think of a better way to do so than to surgically remove the foreskin. With that as the goal, this method is spot on. By protracting the foreskin, manually rolling it forward, the surgeon increases the amount of skin removed to the extent that 30 to 50% of the skin of the shaft of the penis can be excised. The rationale being more is better for this purpose. The typical estimate of skin lost to the adult erect penis is about 15 square inches, sufficient to cover an index card. Remember, this is a double layer of skin rolled on itself, which increases in size if you grow. If you don't have it, it doesn't increase the size, it's not there to grow. So there's a considerable loss of skin to the adult erect penis. What appears to be a physically small thing in the infant, to those who are not feeling their pain nor considering their loss, is in fact a great thing to the adult that the child is to become. Step four, with the foreskin protracted, one of a variety of devices having properties something like a cigar snipper is used to cut away the living tissue. Actually, first there's a clamp put on before they cut it, but I didn't include that here. So it's, clamp, it's, it's protracted, clamped, and then snipped uh, with a cigar snipper type instrument. Once accomplished, the remnant skin, once that clamp is removed, uh, leaves a recoils, leaving a circumferential wound around the shaft of the penis and the freshly stripped glands exposed. Right? So it was de-adhered from the foreskin, so the glands itself is injured, and then the skin is excised circumferentially, thus circumcision, meaning cut around. It kind of makes one dizzy. Uh, just thinking about it, if you dare to do so. Bleeding is staunched with yet another instrument, which itself, if left on overlong, poses its own risks. The physician will apply some gauze with antibiotic ointment to the wound, and the job is considered done. Major complications are also possible at this step. Any inadvertence in the snipping procedure can result in partial or more extensive accidental amputation of the glands or of the entire shaft of the penis. Bleeding can be excessive in some cases. So much skin can be removed that the penis is ex effectively stripped of skin, as in degloving in injuries. Not just in the past, but even today, circumcision still sometimes results in injuries requiring reconstructive surgery. Circumcision, circumcision does indeed sometimes prove fatal. These risks are downplayed or not mentioned, rendering the notion of informed consent on the part of parents deeply suspect. We are not talking about a procedure that is medically required. We are talking about a voluntary cosmetic surgery for which the actual subject can give no consent at all, for which there are genuine, serious, non-trivial risks. Impact. A, de a detailed account of the impact of circumcision when the procedure is botched is beyond the scope of this chapter. Instead, we will reserve our discussion to the impact of the surgery when it goes exactly as planned and intended. 
For starters, the immune function of the penis is essentially removed, leaving the glands and urethral meatus through which the urine passes exposed to the elements. The opening is now opened. If your eyelid were removed, your eyelids would not fare so well, nor does the penis. When the foreskin is removed, the production of smegma is curtailed, and so too the benefits of its antiseptic properties. Urine, with its moisturizing property, no longer bathes the exposed glands regularly within its covered foreskin. Um, so, no longer bathes the exposed glands regularly, leaving it subject to drying. The contact of the exposed glands with diapers and clothing results in a thickening of the dead skin cell layers. The glands of the circumcised will have as many as 20 additional layers of squamous epithelium than we would find in an intact counterpart. Pleasure sensitivity is thus reduced by this formation of what amounts to a callus over the glands. The foreskin is not extra skin incidental to the penis. It is a critical anatomical feature essential to the basic functioning of the organ. The penis is an organ, one of the marvels of which is the fact that it can change size drastically. In its flaccid state, the skin sagging past the glands might appear as extra to someone who is unfamiliar with the normal anatomy of the intact structure. However, when the erectile tissues engorge, one of the many functions of the foreskin becomes clear. The foreskin rolls back and becomes the shaft skin of the penis in its erect state. If, the circum if, in if by circumcision you take away the skin that was there to accommodate the erection, what is a penis to do? As the erectile tissue fills with blood upon excitation, the growing member must recruit skin from the pubic, from the pubic area to, to dress itself. The resulting erection must overstretch the available skin. Having recruited skin from the pubic region to do the job, the penis now has hair rising up the shaft, which hair will now be introduced into the partner during intercourse. This is not the design, nor is it an improvement on the normal hygiene of sex. Depending on the severity of the cut, the resultant skin shortage also can result in a bent or painful erection, in addition to it being inordinately hairy. Have you ever seen that bowed back, straining away look uh, in its undersized skin suit? You might not have to look very far. Perhaps you just mistook it for enthusiasm. And even if not painful or bent, at the very least, the play of the skin over the shaft will be significantly diminished or absent, varying with the severity of the cut. Without this play of the skin over the shaft of the penis, the erect shaft, when penetrating a partner, no longer glides in its own sheath, but abrades the epithelial walls of the partner. To approximate the sensations of the intact organ that will result to climax, the circumcised must rub themselves against the interior walls of their partner. Right? If you're not being stimulated by the skin moving over the glands and shaft of the penis, you have to reproduce that stimulation by rubbing against your partner's internal uh, epithelial walls. Uh, to approximate, yeah. So the friction is no longer mediated by the abundant and playful shaft skin as given. Without the contact being mediated, the pressure-loving vaginal walls cannot hug the skin in place, instead being frictioned directly with the movements of intercourse. This is a very different mechanics of sex than you would have with an intact partner. Further, when the friction is direct rather than mediated, the circumcised penis robs the natural lubrication of the vagina for itself. The foreskin is no longer there to stimulate the glands with its gentle back and forth movement lubricated by its own bubble urethral fluid. Instead, the penis will borrow the vaginal lubricants to mediate the friction of the taut skin of itself once circumcised against the vaginal walls. Uh, because the glands is relatively calloused as compared to the intact pars intima, the circumcised must work that much harder to climax without benefit of being stimulated by the motion of the foreskin. The effort to generate sufficient friction to overcome the diminished sensation in the callous glands and the need to friction directly against the vaginal walls together create a need for a more aggressive movement on the part of the circumcised partner in order to climax. Circumcision consequently alters the physiology of intercourse 
repurposing a woman's lubricity and vaginal walls for a foreskin. It also alters the actual choreography of intimacy, and so its character. Sex becomes more jitterbug than tango. We can also only wonder as to the latent emotional and formative impact on the infant brain from a direct assault on the pars intima so shortly upon exiting the safety of the womb. We too easily dismiss what amounts to a very deep violation from literally out of the starting gate. If infants could talk, I have a feeling they would tell a very different story than what is told about them. Our culture at large fails to empathize with the pain, suffering, and betrayal of the smallest, weakest, and most dependent and most vulnerable among us. For lack of a voice in the matter, we subject infants to treatment that we would abhor if done to us and do so with only the most specious and uninspected rationalizations. Rationalizations, next section. A rationalization is a, my PhD is actually in ethics, not anatomy. Um, so this, this isn't out of my wheelhouse to discuss these things for folks who might think so. <laughs> I will get comments. A ra stay in your wheelhouse, go. A rationalization is a purported reason mustered to justify a foregone conclusion. Did you catch that? A rationalization is something offered as a reason that's mustered to justify a foregone conclusion. It's not a reason, a ra a reason moving towards an, un an unknown conclusion, but you have a conclusion and you make up the reasons afterwards. Rationalizations pose as arguments. They are not arguments. The original reason for circumcision practiced not as a mark of the covenant, but instead as a prophylactic against pleasure, was introduced above. Time seems to have worn upon our cultural memory. The problematization of the penis as an organ of pleasure, requiring surgical curtailment for the sake of moral safety, is long forgotten. However, bad habits can be hard to break. We tend to create reasons where there really are none to justify the repetition of actions for which there is cultural inertia. One such type of rationalization is the argument from hygiene. It is true that failure to maintain basic standards of hygiene can result in infection and disease transmission. This is no less true with regard to the hands than the foreskin. And if you suggested amputating infant hands to prevent the future spread of disease, you would rightly be considered mad. It is no less mad to amputate the foreskin as a disease prophylactic, yet circumcision amounts to nothing less than exactly that by that reason. Everyone knows they need their hands, but not everyone knows we need our foreskins. This tissue was vilified and marginalized in the past in a way that generated a culture in which people could think we would be better off without it. Moral safety was believed to be at stake, and the foreskin was the scapegoat sacrificed to appease fears of pleasure and its dangers. However, suggesting the penis is somehow more hygienic without the foreskin is patently ridiculous. The opposite is true. The foreskin protects the hygiene of the pars intima. So does basic self-cleaning. We wake up in the morning with the sandman cresting the corners of our eyes. We don't cut off our eyelids because of it. We wash our face. And any doctor who tells you, Johnny might not wash his face carefully, so I suggest we remove his eyelids to protect himself and his future girlfriends, would not be thinking straight. Teach Johnny to wash his face. It is true that if we don't wash our privates, we will likely smell bad and possibly spread diseases. The solution is practicing and promoting simple hygiene, not amputation. Another argument is the cosmetic one. This argument goes like this. The baby's father is circumcised, so the baby should be too, because the baby should look like his father. But if a baby is the spitting image of its mother, we don't suggest infant plastic surgery to correct the discrepancy. If the baby is going to be taller than its father, we don't suggest removing a section of its femur so it matches dad. If dad is ugly and the baby pretty, we don't immediately subject the infant to reconstructive surgery without benefit of anesthesia to make them match. Children can handle being different from their parents. They are not clones. Parents can handle being different from their children. They always are. Both of my sons are intact and very glad to be so. When they were old enough to notice that their bits looked different than mine, it was a very simple matter to explain it to them. I told them that when I was a baby, something happened to me. Grammy and Gramps let the doctor cut off parts of my penis because they didn't know any better. I made sure nobody did that to you. 
your penis is just the way it's supposed to be. Thank goodness. They were very happy to be different than dad in this regard, and they remain so to this day. Folks will spin similar arguments about the locker room, suggesting that the boys will make fun of their child if their penis looks different, and so circumcise on this ground. Like all people, children too can be merciless and cruel to one another at times, poking fun and bullying. Circumcising to prevent cruelty is definitely a case of the pot, calling the kettle black. The notion of sparing a child from future harm by harming them in the present is a strange bit of logic, and strapping infants to boards and cutting their penises takes bullying to a level far beyond comparison to anything I ever saw in the locker room. Children have different skin tones, different speech patterns, different sneakers, different socioeconomic status, and all the variations of human anatomy possible. Furthermore, all circumcised penises do not look alike. The appearance of the glands is as variable as the appearance of the face. Circumcision will no more prevent bullying than demanding that everyone remove their hat. And maintaining your child's pars intima intact is a good start to teaching them that they are okay exactly as they are. Another argument put forth in medical circles is to prevent later surgeries for phimosis. I was teaching a class once and a participant approached me to say that he had been circumcised due to phimosis as a teenager. He argued that if he had been circumcised as an infant, he would not have had to undergo this painful trauma. Therefore, he stated it made sense that all infants should be circumcised. This actually makes no sense at all. Phimosis is a real problem, no doubt. There can be strangulation of the glands by, by a hypercontraction of the peripenic muscle. Phimosis is a relatively rare condition of pathological non-retractability of the foreskin. The normal adhesion of the foreskin to the glands of the infant and growing child should not be mistaken for a pathology. So, phimosis has been raised in status to our culture to simply non-retractability of an adherent penis. And then this would justify circumcision. I hope you're understanding that the adhesion of the foreskin to the immature penis is normal and that eventually it becomes retractable over time as mentioned at the beginning. Um, pathological phimosis is diagnosed when a tight ring forms in the muscle layer of the penile skin, resulting in non-retractability of the foreskin, and possible strangulation of the erectile tissues resulting in painful erections and possible skin tearing. Phimosis can be very painful and can require medical attention to resolve the condition. Stretching and steroidal cleams, uh, stretching and steroidal Stretching and steroidal creams can resolve the problem, though in severe cases, a surgical incision may be required, and in the very worst case, circumcision. Now, the fellow in my class who was still suffering consciously from the trauma of his circumcision was basically saying, I wish I didn't have that experience in my body or memory banks, and I wouldn't wish it on anyone else. Sadly, everyone who is circumcised has already suffered the same trauma as he did, the only difference being that they cannot consciously remember it. It's been burnished into their subconscious, and, 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 and we live at the effect of that subconscious burning. The body, the brain, the impressionable forming character remembers what the mind, the conscious mind, may not. There is no erasing this imprint on the developing brain and psyche. Circumcision is a shocking welcome to the world, and circumcising millions to avoid later circumcising some much smaller percentage is a bit of a back-ass word logic, if ever there was some. If we cut off everyone's legs as infants, we can reduce the incidence of painful knee surgery later in life to zero. We wouldn't consider it a generalizable public health policy to prevent the scourge of breast cancer by encouraging prophylactic double mastectomies of all developing girls. Such a proposal would be met with shock and horror, as should any indecent proposal, even though it would end breast cancer forever. Qui bono? Who benefits? Uh, this is this is a tough part of the chapter. If that wasn't tough, it gets tougher. Sorry, this is tough stuff, but if we don't talk about it, if it just goes on as a joke uh, about, uh, you know, uh, and, and think it's a good thing, then, then we, we will continue to abuse our infants. Who benefits? The main reason we don't, as a culture, cringe viscerally at circumcision is not because it is such a natural and sensible thing. It is because we haven't paused to think for even a few minutes about it for what it is. 
Parents go along with it for lack of unbiased information. There is cultural inertia behind routine infant circumcision, which medical practice has failed to contravene, and infants are not in a position to argue. Some of the more extreme proponents of circumcision go so far as to liken it to childhood vaccination and sell it very hard. I actually read that in an article. Desperately um, concerned that circumcision rates were dropping and this, this fabulous procedure, uh, by being in this article in CBS News, likened, likened to vaccination, like a vaccination for your penis, um, uh, what a shame. Well, one can only wonder when such outrageous claims are made, who benefits? Who actually benefits from a procedure which most of the world considers to be arcane, barbaric, and unthinkable, not to mention unethical? And that is true. We are the smaller percentage uh, in the United States who continue to uh, consider universal circumcision as a good idea. As is often the case with tissues of the body which have been actively problematized in the public mind, there are vested financial interests in harvesting the foreskin. Human tissues have always been valued for all sorts of medical applications and so commodified directly or indirectly. Many rules and laws are in place to prevent markets for human tissue given the ethical considerations. Nonetheless, the services surrounding the use of donated tissues cost money. They're safe and ethical collection, storage, tracking, testing for various communicable diseases, purification, preservation, transportation, administration, safety, ethical oversight, disposal, and additional ancillary services do not come cheaply. Consequently, markets around the use of human tissues are ultimately necessary, even though the veil between them and the outright selling of the tissues can become very, very thin. The general need for the use of human tissues for research and medical applications still cannot justify taking from one and selling to another without real consent. Most folks would agree that harvesting healthy tissues from neonates for profit sounds ethically dubious at the very start and generates all sorts of conflicts of interest and room for abuse of consent. Yet this is exactly the case with regards to the foreskin in the United States. One man's junk is another man's treasure. Medical consent forms vary from one clinic to another, but as an example, take that of Brigham and Women's Hospital affiliated with Harvard Medical School, certainly an exemplary institution. With reference to the foreskin <coughs> harvested via circumcision, the form states, quote, these materials may also be used by WBH or other academic or commercial entities for research, education purposes, including photo photographing, or other activity, if in furtherance of the hospital's missions. This is a wide open door for upselling the tissue. Let me read that again. These materials may also be used by WBH or other academic or commercial entities for research education purposes, including photographing or other activity, if in furtherance of the hospital's missions. This is a wide open door for the upselling of the tissues. The profit margins at each stage of the marketing of foreskins place it in a category unparalleled. Circumcision is singularly the most common pediatric surgery in the United States. From a business perspective, circumcision is a brilliant product to be selling. You make money coming and going. Consequently, there is very little interest on the part of the hospital industry or the business side customers further down the line in cultivating a deeper understanding of the tissue or a deep and ethical consent for its removal, if such a thing were even possible, or rather, for the refusal to remove it. Best that folks think it is just an unsightly and vestigial flap of skin that you would really be better off without, and that the surgery is a trivial matter that should be done the sooner the better. Just sign here, easy peasy. Hospitals charge first for the procedure and charge again for the removal of medical waste under which whitewashing category the tissue may initially fall. In any case, by first inviting consent for seemingly noble uses such as research and education first, less savory applications can be inadvertently or unknowingly consented to under the category of use by commercial entities for other purposes. The foreskin can now be upsold based on this kind of permission to biomedical companies to process the tissue for further use. One square centimeter of human skin contains approximately six million cells. A vial of half a million 
cryogenically frozen dermal fibroblasts from a newborn's foreskin goes for an asking price when I wrote this several years ago, from between $419 to $454. Uh, did you get that? <laughs> one square centimeter, one square centimeter, one square centimeter, right there, of human skin contains approximately 6 million cells. A vial of a half a million, so this much will provide then 12 vials, this much will provide 12 vials of skin cells, and that skin cell from a newborn's foreskin, cryogenically frozen dermal fibroblast, neonate cryogenically frozen dermal fibroblast, goes for an asking, that means foreskin, folks, goes for an asking price for between $419 to $454 based on current market prices in the company catalogs. Just go to the websites of Thermo Fisher Scientific or IX Cells Biotech Analogy for details if you are in the market for this sort of thing. These cells can then be doubled in culture as many as 16 times, creating 32 billion cells. Repeatedly upsold through multiple levels of the market, neonatal foreskins reap exponential profits for those companies involved with no justifiable, justifiable benefit and real harm done to the infant donor whose birthright and focal point of pleasure center has been unceremoniously stolen. If openly explained to the parents, there would be there would doubtlessly be a lot fewer of them consenting. Consenting, I put in quotes, because how can one consent for another under these circumstances? Tell parents explicitly that this procedure will subject your healthy child and its healthy tissue to a number of gravely serious risks such as hemorrhaging, sepsis, inadvertent penile amputation and death, not to mention certain pain, bleeding, crushing of tissue, more pain, a permanent imprint and sensitization of the developing brain, an immediate diminishment of immune function and eventually sexual function, and the very real risk of ongoing problems. There's absolutely no immediate medical necessity for this procedure at this time. The foreskin is a part of normal, healthy human anatomy. In short, it belongs there. Despite being a real surgery, the procedure may very well be done by someone as a training exercise who has no real surgical skill. And by the way, your child's foreskin is a valuable commodity from which we will certainly profit. It will be sold for a market price by the square centimeter, increasing our interest in doing a good job and getting it all. Waste not, want not. We might use the tissue for skin grafts or other surgical applications, but it is also likely we will sell it to commercial ventures. Our biotech customers will process it to create many cell lines out of it. Nothing beats the various amazing rejuvenating physiological properties of neonatal human dermal fibroblasts derived from your baby's foreskin. Those companies themselves will further sell those cells by the vial at a profit to be propagated exponentially in petri dishes by cosmetic companies. They will then sell it yet again in various suspensions to upscale boutique spas where rich folk will receive your baby's precious birthright via high-priced injections to mollify their concern about facial wrinkles. Youth doesn't come cheap after all. Parents might think twice about signing the form, and it's about time they did. Think twice about signing the form. Restoration. For all the years that I have been teaching my dissection workshops, I have to, I'm sure you thought the way this thing started out that it was going to be a little more fun and that it wouldn't go so dark. But I, I don't make this stuff up. I've had people who I've mentioned these things to say, I just couldn't believe it. And then they go looking for it. You can see uh, Steve Harvey being uh, having foreskin enhanced creams applied to his face on his TV show. You can see Oprah talking about it. Uh, you know, I think those are amazing um, front people for uh, and can communicate amazing things to the world. And I, I don't, I don't put them down. But I, I think that in this in this point, they're uneducated, um, and uh, and they're not alone in that. We're all uneducated. That's why I wrote this chapter. Uh, so hopefully, when people hear this, I, I forgive my own circumcision. It happened. What what? You know, you just let you, you let things go, forgive, and yet it comes from unknowing. But once you know, then it becomes a different thing. If you know and you still and you still uh, get on board with this, well, that's a different matter. Uh, restoration. For all the years that I have been teaching my dissection workshops, I have discussed the anatomy of the foreskin of the intact pars intima and circumcision. 
This is three decades now. I also habitually spoke to the fact that in the case of the circumcised, with effort, it is possible to stretch the skin and recover the glands. As mentioned in the history section above, for as long as cultures have been removing foreskins, men have been doing their best to restore themselves to their original condition. This is true now as ever. Over the years, several men on my courses have reported accomplishing exactly that. So I knew that this feat of anatomical re-manifestation was possible. Yet for many years, I joked that although I had been stretching my bits for my entire life, my foreskin had never grown back. The joke always got a laugh, and after nearly 20 years of telling it, it no longer struck me as funny. I finally wondered, after all, exactly why had it not grown back? It turns out that not all stretches are equal. Skin is naturally elastic. When stretched within its physiological limit, skin returns upon release to its initial pre-stretched level of tension. However, when skin is stretched beyond its physiological limit, the skin takes this as a signal to propagate new skin cells to grow. That growth ultimately increases the surface area to accommodate the mechanical stress placed upon it. When possible, Reconstructive surgeons take advantage of this principle to correct skin coverage issues as in the case of congenital deformities, burns, etc. By inflating expanders positioned underneath the skin to stimulate new skin growth of the type appropriate to the area, they can induce skin coverage of the affected area while avoiding the challenges and limitations posed by skin graphing. Amazing, right? You slip something under the skin, you blow it up, it stretches the skin, the skin grows, instead of maybe having to put a patch of other skin, that causes another injury. So this principle of stretching skin beyond its physiological limit to induce new cell growth and increase surface area can be applied to the restoration of the foreskin as well. This, the particular methods applied to induce new skin cell growth in the penile shaft will depend upon the severity of the original cut. This principle of stretching the skin beyond its physiological limit to induce new cell growth and increase surface area can be applied to the restoration of the foreskin as well. The particular methods applied to induce new skin cell growth in the penile shaft will depend upon the severity of the original cut. Circumcision cuts can be placed on an index of severity rated for normal hang length, that is, when the penis is neither erect nor shrunk from cold. Let's say a level one cut would result in a penis where at normal hang length, the skin comes over the corona of the glands so that the glands remains partially covered with only its tip visible. That's what I saw in the Turkish baths. For a level two cut, the skin would bunch up to the corona of the glands, but it would not make it over its ridge, leaving the glands completely exposed. In the case of a level three cut, you will find some wrinkling and slack in the skin along the shaft of the penis at normal hang length, but not enough to bunch up at the corona of the glands. A penis subject to a level four cut would exhibit no wrinkling or slackness of the shaft skin at all at normal hang length. Uh, too, too much information? That, that's how I started. Uh, the cut of circumcision will have removed so much skin that when erect, the shaft skin will be very taut and the erectile tissue will likely be somewhat bent or bowed. A level five cut will indicate, would indicate deeper levels of mutilation of the penile shaft beyond the removal of the skin, resulting in further severe deformity and disability. While level five cuts would likely require a more complex corrective surgery, levels one through four can be helped with self-applied methods. There are a variety of devices invented by ingenious folks who are keen to reclaim an intact status for their pars intima and help others do the same. Folks with cuts in the range of levels three to four will, however, unlikely have enough existing skin in place to actually make use of such devices. You need some skin to use the device. Um, for those in these more severe categories, you have to start with manual stretching. As my old joke made clear enough, the stretching must be of a particular type. You must take the skin into a range of tension beyond its physiological limit. This really is a simple matter to do manually. Create two circles with thumb and index fingers of each hand placed in contact with the shaft skin, whether flaccid or erect. Then gently pull in opposite directions and hold for 20 seconds or so to create a non-painful tensioning of the skin between the encircling fingers. 
The position can then be adjusted along the shaft until many stretches beyond the physiological limit of normal tension of the skin have been induced over the entire surface area of the skin. This method will quickly begin to induce skin growth. The rate of growth, however, depends upon the time spent devoted to this type of stretching. Strong underlying motivation is required for what is an undoubtedly tedious and long-term effort. Starting with a level 4 cut, the path to recovery is a long one. Still, it took only a few months to relieve the historic tension from which I was personally subject. That initial change was so encouraging, I knew I could dedicate myself to further progress. After working with manual stretching intermittently over several years, with several long breaks, I created enough slack skin that I could finally use a device to create a prolonged, hands-free counter-stretch. I wear it primarily while writing this book. I can personally testify, uh, though not while reading it. I can personally testify, as others also might, who have engaged in a restoration program, that the experience of recovering one's original endowment is an extraordinarily positive one. However slow the progress may be, the subtle changes in the experience of sex and self-image are real and lasting with further transformations on the horizon. The principles of regrowth engage basic skin physiology. They are accessible to anyone who would take advantage of them. Thought reframe. Language is important. The words we use to describe our pars intima tell much about our relationship to ourselves. If we habitually reference the human penis as circumcised or uncircumcised, we ally with the cultural preference for circumcision. We align consciously or not with all that circumcision entails. Circumcision alters our experience of sexuality characterizes the way we treat the most dependent and helpless among us, undermines the given structures for pleasure, and changes the character of our intimacy. When circumcision is the cultural norm, being uncircumcised becomes a defective state, a condition where something is lacking. The uncircumcised are somehow missing something, and that lack is abnormal. The language of circumcised and uncircumcised makes circumcision right and the lack thereof wrong. The language is normative. Yet on a global scale, the normalization of circumcision itself is abnormal. Rates of circumcision are highest at around 90% in Israel and countries with Muslim majorities due to the religious practice of circumcision among those faiths. These places are followed at a rate among adult males of around 70% in the United States. Although there is some evidence that the rate of circumcision of newborns is declining, the overall rate remains high as compared with the rest of the world. Worldwide estimates place the rate of circumcision among males at around 30%. That's in the whole world. Two-thirds of those represent religious practice, leaving only 10% circumcised for non-religious reasons. As mentioned, in America, circumcision of infants was adopted during those historical periods collectively known as the Great Awakening. It was taken up as a medical cure specifically chosen to suppress pleasure, and it is now perpetuated with quasi-medical rationalizations by cultural habit, ignorance, and vested financial interests. Circumcision is not the norm on planet Earth, except among certain religious communities. Our language could easily better reflect this reality and challenge the normalization of circumcision in the United States. By speaking of the intact pars intima rather than the uncircumcised, our language practice could help to normalize the status of those who have not undergone the trauma and pain of infant surgery with no immediate medical necessity, rather than those having so suffered. The intact lack nothing at all. They are normal. They still have that which they had originally. Their sex function is intact. Their immune system is intact. Their anatomy is safe and sound. Being intact is a point of pride for men who know what they have. They know their bodies to be sound and whole. They have avoided the impact of a traumatic violation of their person. The fitting adjective for their pars intima is intact. The problematization of the penis in our culture is linked to the problematization of pleasure. Where pleasure is suspect, so are its instruments. Pleasure is one of the central means by which the healthy human body communicates its status to the conscious mind. Pleasure is a basic mechanism of homeostasis. It keeps us on the planet longer. When the mechanisms of pleasure are repressed and undermined, 
distortions are introduced into the body and emotional life. The human body is an instrument exquisitely tuned for pleasure. Turning the screw of pain hard at the outset of life changes the tone of the instrument going forward and not for the better. No need for that. We are, no, we are long past the era of the Puritan's suspicion of pleasure and the Victorian evangelical missionary's zeal to repress it. Those who are intact among us, along with those striving to increase our numbers, represent the new normal. Welcome an era that recognizes the human body in its wholeness for the great gift that it is, including its potential for pleasure. So that's the chapter, folks. Um, I think that, that was pretty intense. I forgot. I hadn't read it in a while. I just, just, just read it myself, and I'm like, <laughs> oh my gosh. But I have to say, um, as I said somewhere in that chapter, our failure to have a conversation about circumcision, our failure to meaningfully solicit informed consent, meaning real information that you're free to refuse because the information might change your mind, like in that wicked paragraph that I read uh, about <laughs> the actual uh, way that the whole process can be described, I think would immediately reduce uh, the adaptation of circumcision as a normal thing where healthy tissues are removed on an unconsenting and un, un, uh, unknowing being uh, would, would change. But I also think, I was thinking about it today when I was thinking, maybe I'll read this chapter. It dawned on me, how do you, you know, change the financial interests? If insurance companies stop paying for circumcision as they stop paying for it in the UK, then people just stop having circumcision because no one's going to pay for a surgery that they don't need. So uh, really, you have to go for the financial interest to change this, I think. And I'm sure that anyone who has a financial interest <laughs> who's listening in that is going to hope that I'm banned. But um, all I can say is, for now, let's give it a careful consideration. And when we think about um, the properties of the foreskin and its value uh, as, as part of our human uh, in, immune system as part of our sex physiology and sex mechanics and uh, as a source of pleasure. Um, not only that, but also protecting our infants from, from this kind of an assault. I think, uh, I think we can sort of change, the, change the, 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 point, the needle of the compass in the direction towards the intact, uh, intact status. Thanks for listening. Thanks for watching. If you'd like to study more with me, go to gilheadley.com. There's a ton of stuff there. Enjoy.